Welcome to Human Monsters. Farian Edward Wardrip was born in Salem, Indiana on March 6, 1959. His mother and father were Diana and George Wardrip. Farian was one of six children and by far the most troublesome, as this tale will tell. Farian was possessed of a melancholic and cynical disposition, and it seemed that there was nothing anybody could do about it. When Farian's moods didn't improve much with the onset of adolescence, he medicated with drugs and alcohol. His contempt for the world manifested with petty crime, starting when he was 13 years old. He was caught stealing from a local shop, and as time would tell, it wasn't a bookstore. He could have been punished by a stint in juvenile hall, where he would have been bullied and raped. Instead, he was taught how to earn an honest living by being put to work picking beans at a garden center in Marion, Indiana. Unexpectedly, Farian didn't feel punished. He rather enjoyed the work. Perhaps that explains why he didn't learn the whole lesson about how crime doesn't pay, for it compensated him with a stolen bicycle when he spotted one unattended on a neighbor's property. He made it to the senior year of his high school, but he elected to drop out, just as most of his peers were considering careers that didn't involve name tags or steel-toed boots. In 1978, Farian decided to try his hand in the armed forces when he enlisted in the National Guard. He followed through with training and remained with the organization for five years. He received a dishonorable discharge due to his failure to quit his drug habit. He was smoking marijuana, and his excessive use made him late for roll calls, which is a serious violation in the National Guard, which requires strict self-discipline of its personnel. He left in 1983. At the age of 20, Farian got a job as a janitor and married 20-year-old Joanna Jackson. They had two children. Farian was a fuck-up who couldn't hold any one job down for long. The bills kept piling up, and unfortunately smoking them rolled up with pot wouldn't have kept the debts at bay. His wife was about as fed up with him as his former commanding officers in the National Guard. Her parents dropped by the apartment and were prepared to leave with Joanne and the kids when Farian appeared. He had confronted them, becoming most aggressive toward her father, Floyd, insisting that he had no right to take his family from him. It got to the point where the confrontation was so heated, it appeared as though Farian would assault Floyd. Floyd launched with a preemptive kick to Farian's face. That was some Bruce Lee power shit, for it knocked Farian off his feet. When Farian got back to his feet... He announced he was running to get help, though he didn't specify what that entailed. He ran back to the apartment where he probably just smoked a doob and twiddled his ball sack. Actually, it was far more ominous than that. Floyd was pulling out of the parking lot with his wife, Joanna, and the kids when Farian emerged from the apartment building with his help, a butcher knife he brandished. As you can imagine, he didn't intend to critique Floyd's culinary skills. Floyd appeared to take Farian seriously, for he tore out of there and peeled some treads as he drove homeward bound. There Farian was, alone in the world. He was just a druggie, with nothing to look forward to, and a one-way ticket to a downward spiral. This isn't about a guy from the South, but I'll say it anyway. She it. As it turned out, that terminology is very apropos at that point in the story. For Farian Wardrip made his way to Texas. 
He got hired as a janitor again because there's no point making leather couch money when you don't live in a shorts with leather couch climate. He was a night janitor at Wichita General Hospital. There is no word on why his employer wouldn't let him work days. Maybe it's like having a girlfriend who won't hold your hand in public. During the day, he was sad, lonely, and stoned. Pot doesn't help you escape your problems. It places them under a microscope. As he worked, he mopped up what remained of his dignity. He did manage to make a few friends, however. Usually, when somebody makes friends, it's indicative of the fact that their life is on the up and up. As time would tell, this wouldn't be the case. December 20th, 1984. Terry Sims and her friend, Lisa Boone, got together for a Christmas celebration and gift exchange at a mutual friend's house. Terry let herself in as Lisa went to the hospital, where she did not work as a janitor and began a graveyard shift as a nurse. Terry had a few drinks, so she fumbled with the house keys at first. When she finally got the key into the lock, she let herself in. A few minutes after getting settled in the apartment, Terry heard somebody pound on the door. To her surprise, it was not Lisa or anyone else she knew. It was this tall, menacing figure. He burst through the door. He was clearly out of his mind, for he was ranting about wanting to talk. She couldn't fathom why this stranger would want to talk to her, of all people, and at that hour. She tried to run, but he caught her. He threw her to the floor. He jumped down on top of her. He pinned her to the floor with all his weight. He unleashed a frenzy of punches on her with all his strength and fury. He was screaming expletives in her face as if it were also his intention to scald her psychologically. In the twisted mind of Farian Wardrip, Terry became an amalgam of everyone he blamed for his problems, and he deflected the karma to her doorstep. Amid the beating, he dished out sadistically, he savored every moment of her anguish. The more she cried out, the more it spurned him on. He was fueled by her fear. This apparently was the pre-Viagra organic enhancement he needed, for he began to tear at her clothes. He ripped off her smock. He dragged her into a bedroom. Terry tried to wriggle free from Wardrip's grip, but he pulled out a knife and poked her in the chest a few times to demonstrate that her despair meant little to him. They barely qualified as flesh wounds. They were more like inoculation pricks. But he was the biggest prick of all, and he clearly meant business. So she ceded control to him for the time being. I use the phrase, time being loosely. It may have been less than five seconds, just long enough for her to grab the blade of the knife with her bare hand, like Rob Roy. It wasn't motivated by pride or valiance as much as survival. But she was determined that he never look back upon this event as an unblemished triumph. For this attempt to defend herself, the blade cut straight through her fingers. The pain was excruciating, and Terry screamed. Wardrip tossed her onto the bed. He yanked off her bra. Both garments were bloodied. He tossed them to the floor. Despite her physical suffering, Terry was outraged at finding herself stripped of clothing in such an undignified fashion. She began writhing and twisting with every limb, making it difficult for him to gain control of her body. Wardrip grabbed an electrical cord, cut a section of it off, and bound her arms behind her back. Terry could no longer fight him off in this position. He removed what remained of her clothing and raped her. 
Wardrip dragged Terry to the bathroom. He leaned her against the bathtub. He stabbed her, slashing her a total of 17 times. As a current of blood bathed the floor beneath them, she succumbed to the injuries and died. Wardrip was beside himself. He couldn't believe he had done this. He had raped a woman. He murdered her. This was new. It was as if he were possessed. He left the apartment in a daze. Perhaps in an effort to dissociate himself from the experience, he told himself that not only had he not done it, but he hadn't even been there in the first place. Lisa arrived at the apartment building at 7 a.m. after her shift. Terry had her only key, so she was locked out. She went to the landlord to get the spare key. When Lisa entered the apartment, she knew immediately that something was wrong. Something terrible had happened. Many objects were left in disarray. It looked as if someone had been tossed to and fro. She called out Terry's name, but there was no response. Lisa walked throughout the apartment to where her friend might be. She stopped when she saw a pool of blood on the floor with its origin point in the bathroom. She turned around and ran outside. Outside, Lisa summoned a neighbor who happened to be there and got them to contact the authorities. Moments later, the police descended on the scene after the landlords had a look at the bathroom. Terry was not known to have enemies, so the crime seemed to be random. The investigation was likely to be difficult. The next day, Farian Wardrip woke up feeling like the events of the previous evening must have been a dream. There really was something surreal about them. Even after seeing stories in the news about the woman's death, it seemed impossible to him somehow. He went back to his job as usual. He couldn't mop up the general sense of misery he always felt. He couldn't do it with the anger that continued to arise from deep within him either. One redolent deodorant cake in the filthy, encrusted urinal of Farian Wardrip's life was when he first caught sight of an attractive nurse who worked at Wichita General, 23-year-old Tony Gibbs. She is remembered for being polite, petite, easy on the eyes, perky, and outgoing. Though Tony was approachable and friendly with most people, one exception was Firian Wardrip, who apparently made her skin crawl. She was distant with him and made him feel snubbed. His attempts at chit-chat fell flat, and he would eventually come to resent her. January 19, 1985. Tony Gibbs was walking through the parking lot of Wichita General when she spotted Farian Wardrip walking around, clearly drunk, staggering. Tony had just finished a shift and was heading to her car. Tony may not have felt comfortable in his presence, but she was a compassionate sort and couldn't help but wonder if Farian needed help. She asked him if he needed any help. He asked her if she would give him a ride. She agreed, and they headed to her car. Once inside Tony's car, Farian began making demands of Tony. For one thing, instead of giving her a specific address, he told her to drive him to U.S. Highway 281. Tony was reluctant to drive out to an open road of that kind, which enraged Farian. He screamed at her to drive. Tony was frightened and did as she was told. 
fearing what reprisals might come if she didn't. As Tony drove along US-281, Farian started mauling her. He grabbed her jacket and yanked her toward him. He told her he needed to talk to her. He rattled her so much she swerved off the road. There was a dirt road nearby. Farian ordered her to drive down that road. Farian demanded that Tony stop when they drove up to an empty construction site. When she brought the car to a stop, he grabbed her and started shoving her back and forth while screaming at her, telling her he hated her. Tony was as perplexed as she was terrified. Knowing her life was critically imperiled, Tony opened up her door and jumped out. She hit the ground running, fleeing from the scene. Varian got out and ran after her. He caught up before long and tackled her. He carried her to a disused school bus. Once he got her inside the bus, he stripped off her clothing. He removed his own clothes. Varian raped Tony. He sodomized her. Once Farian fucked out all his rage, he collapsed beside Tony. They lay side by side. Farian fished through his pants pocket, looking for something. He pulled out an object. It was too dark inside the bus to see what it was. Tony's impressions were strictly tactile. She felt a sharp, piercing sensation. She was being stabbed. Farian stabbed her viciously, wildly plunging the blade until her body ceased to spasm and he was assured of her demise. As Tony's body spouted blood, Farian jumped up, dressed, and left the bus. Farian got in Tony's car and drove away. He abandoned the car about a half mile away from where he lived. Tony managed to drag herself from the bus. She crawled a hundred yards before she succumbed to her injuries and perished. When Tony failed to appear for her next shift at Wichita General, her supervisor became concerned. Tony was always reliable. It just wasn't like her to be absent without first notifying management. Her supervisor was convinced something was wrong. Tony's emergency contact was her brother, Jeff. Jeff, too, was surprised to hear that Tony was a no-show without calling in. He called their brother Walter. Both men descended upon Wichita Falls in search of their sister. They first went to her apartment building. Her car was not parked there. When they inspected her apartment, they found that everything appeared to be in order. Jeff began to fret because he recalled Tony telling him she had recently begun receiving disturbing phone calls from a stranger. Jeff wondered if she had been stopped. He feared the worst. He called their parents. They didn't know anything. They went to Wichita Falls to help in the search efforts. They went to Wichita PD to file a missing persons report. The first lead in the case came from the discovery of Tony's car on Van Buren Street. Tony's purse containing her identification was inside. The most worrisome details were the spots of blood on the driver's seat and door handles. Due to this, foul play was suspected. Tony's mother and father held a press conference, whereupon they announced Tony's disappearance and a $1,000 reward for the tip that would lead to the arrest of the individual responsible. 
Varian Wardrip saw the story of Tony Gibbs' disappearance on the news. Somehow, through denial, he told himself there was no way he could be responsible. In his mind, this was plausible because when they announced her address, he knew it was a place to whence he had never been. Nurses began to wonder if the killer was specifically targeting practitioners of their profession, and sales of firearms and enrollments in self-defense classes skyrocketed. One day, an employee of Texas Electric Service named Charlie Hayes was driving a company vehicle on a remote road when he happened to glance over at a field. He saw something that looked like a large doll. It caught his attention irrevocably, and he stopped to take a closer look. Upon closer inspection, Hayes realized it wasn't a doll. It was the murdered body of a young woman. The remains of Tony Gibbs had been found. Chunks of flesh had been torn from her body by feral scavengers. Charlie Hayes was horrified. He fled to find the nearest telephone so he could contact the police. Before long, police descended on the scene and cordoned off the area as the investigation of her murder began in earnest. One grisly detail was Tony's nursing uniform, which was found in the bus, whose interior was painted multiple coats of red. Naturally, her family was devastated. As her mother said to reporters, I suppose I probably knew while I was in Wichita Falls, but I didn't give up, and I didn't just fall apart. Part of our lives is gone now. She was just so very, very dear to us. I just wish you could have known her. A memorial service was held in Tony's honor in Wichita Falls. There were 400 attendees. Farian Wardrip quit his job at Wichita General. He was just carrying the paradigm of his life forward at that point. Wardrip moved to Fort Worth. He arrived in town with no plans and no job. He settled in the cheapest flea bag motel he could find. Though he couldn't afford health care, he had the medicine for the wretched state of his life, and he shot it straight into his veins. Hours later, Wardrip was wandering the streets in search of a car to steal. He drove it to a dive bar, where whiskey was cheap, and the lineup of stools along the bar was a tapestry of plumber butt. Hours later, Farian Wardrip was sloshed. It helped him cope with what he hoped was just a bad dream from the night before. Within Farian Wardrip's alcohol-fueled delirium, he met 25-year-old Deborah Taylor. Though she was married and a parent of two children, she still enjoyed the nightlife. She had been out with her husband and some of their friends at a house party when she introduced the idea of bar hopping. They declined, but she decided to do the pub crawl by herself. Whilst dancing at a bar... Deborah bumped into a patron named Therian Wardrip. He clearly had some appeal for her, for she agreed to dance with him and even let him drive her home. When they were still in the parking lot, Therian stole a kiss. Deborah slapped him in the face. Therian flew into a rage. He punched her in the face, knocking her to the ground. He put his arm on her throat and began choking her. He made short work of her, choking out her final breath in less than five minutes. As usual, Wardrip was shocked by his own actions. He felt so unaccountable, even he couldn't believe he could do such a thing. Wardrip picked up Deborah's body, placed it in the car he stole, and drove away. 
Having driven far beyond the city limits, Wardrip placed Deborah's corpse adjacent to a stretch of forest. Wardrip drove back to his motel, where he drank and shot up some more. No matter how inebriated or stoned he became, he could not delude himself into thinking he was anything but a cold-blooded killer. The next day, Deborah's family realized she was missing. It was not like her to just run away and abandon her family, especially her children. The police launched an investigation. Her husband, Ken, was frustrated to find himself a suspect, which is typical when married people are murdered. Police felt that the murderer must have been someone she knew since she was dispatched with such brutality. When Deborah Taylor's remains were found, her facial features had deteriorated to such a degree that she was virtually unrecognizable. Ken knew it was her. She was wearing the necklace he bought her for Christmas. He was not yet in the clear as far as being suspected of having been the executioner. He was interrogated multiple times by police and underwent multiple polygraph tests. As if it weren't bad enough, he was mourning the loss of the love of his life. He was accused of dispatching her to the grave and portrayed as a monster. His heart was broken and now the police were stomping on it. His behavior and activities were heavily scrutinized and monitored, with no indication of what would be the right thing to do. His reputation was tarnished for the time being, and it took a toll on his mental health. Farian Wardrip struggled to find work in Fort Worth. He moved back to Wichita Falls and found an apartment. Soon after relocating, Farian met 21-year-old Midwestern State University student Ellen Blau. She was a friend of a tenant named Janie Ball and her husband, Danny. Ellen was remembered as cheerful, upbeat, and eager to bring a smile to everyone's faces. She even threw a smile to her oddball neighbor, Farian Wardrip. Janie did not condone that latter course of action. Janie had observed Farian loitering around the hallways, and something about him gave her the creeps. She advised Ellen to give him a wide berth. Avoiding Wardrip would be easier said than done, since they not only lived close by, but their workplaces were also located within blocks of each other. Ultimately, Ellen decided it would be better to befriend him than make an enemy. She didn't want enemies. In fact, though she was generally highly regarded by her former roommates, she ran afoul of their rental situation when she allowed two men she met randomly out on the street to live there rent-free. September 20th, 1985. Ellen worked at a restaurant called Subs and Suds, and she closed at about 10.30 p.m. On the way home, Ellen stopped at a convenience store. On the way to her car, Ellen was approached by a man. He said, I'd like to talk to you. Politely but firmly, she said, I really need to get home. I have to be back early in the morning. The man was insistent now, saying, But I need to talk. Ellen got into her car. Just as she took her place behind the wheel, the man got into the passenger seat, unbidden. He chugged a bottle of beer. He demanded that she needed to hear him out. Apparently recognizing, as she did, that he had little of substance to say, he said, just drive. He told her to drive to the outskirts of town. They commuted to the type of place where a woman would never want to find herself alone with such a man. Farian Wardrip bitched about his childhood and the difficulties he faced while growing up, and how his parents didn't listen to him. It was as if he were presenting his explanation for what he was about to do to her. Farian made Ellen park in a field located remotely. 
He grabbed her hair and yanked her over to him. As she struggled, he punched her multiple times. He wasn't satisfied with the damage done, so he brought out his knife and stabbed her in a fury. Ellen was fighting more desperately than ever to flee. She managed to eject from the car and run. Farian was too fast for her and soon caught up. He pushed her to the ground. He tore off her clothes and tossed them off to the side. Ellen recoiled from him. Farian beat her about the head brutally. He screamed expletives as he beat her on other areas of her body. No evidence has confirmed whether or not Farian raped Ellen. Her clothing was removed and her panties were yanked down, so the possibility of sexual assault can be inferred. By the time her remains were found, her body had decomposed to the point that any DNA deposited in the form of sperm could not have been found. It was assumed by a pathologist that Ellen was murdered when Mordrip crushed her windpipe. Once he was assured of her demise, he left her corpse where he killed her. Wardrip drove Ellen's car to within a short distance of the apartment complex where he called home. He crash-landed in bed and fell asleep almost instantly, exhausted from homicide. When it became apparent that Ellen was missing, Janie went looking for her. She found Ellen's car and got an eyeful of the ominous visage of blood on the seats. Fearing the worst, she called her husband. He contacted the police, and an investigation was launched. Ellen's mother, Rima, announced a $4,000 reward that she would finance herself. Subs and Suds contributed $2,000 to the fund. Rewards are seldom instrumental in finding a murder victim. A farmer discovered Ellen's body in a field. Ellen's body was nearly unrecognizable, but some of her personal effects were identified, such as a necklace she was known to wear. Janie confirmed when presented with the item that the remains were those of Ellen Blau. The investigation mostly led to dead-end leads and a wrongful conviction, that of a 24-year-old man from Wichita named Danny Lachlan. He knew Ellen a little and was seen riding his motorcycle in the area where the murder was committed. His trial was concluded with a hung jury, however, due to a dearth of irrefutable evidence. May 6, 1986 Barry and Wardrip ran into Tina Kimbrew by chance. They knew each other a little. They knew each other a little, having met in a nightclub and became acquaintances. Their bond hadn't likely run deep enough by this point for him to show up unexpectedly at her door, wanting to talk. Once he walked through the door, he tried to kiss Tina. She recoiled. Outraged, he retaliated, striking her several times. Tina was no pushover, and she fought back as best she could. He came at her with more force and knocked her to the floor. As they struggled, he grabbed her panties and yanked them down. It was about that juncture in his attack that he decided to kill her. He put his arm securely over her nose and mouth, successfully cutting off her air supply. Once she asphyxiated, he fled the scene. Tina's cousin, Shelly Kelly, became concerned about Tina after she neglected to answer her phone for a few days. She and their grandmother decided to check up on her at her apartment. When they arrived at the apartment building, they saw that Tina's car was parked. Assuming she must be home, they knocked on her door, but there was no answer. Shelly had a spare key to Tina's apartment, when they entered the apartment, Tina's dog was hysterical, barking at them both. They saw that the apartment was in disarray, as if it had been hit by a windstorm. 
Initially, they presumed the dog was responsible for the disarray due to separation anxiety. But after taking a few more steps inside, they discovered, to their horror, Tina's dead body. She was flat on her back on the floor with her nightgown pushed up over her torso. Her panties were a place nearby on the floor. Varian Wardrip checked into a hotel in Galveston, Texas. He was feeling remorseful and began to contemplate suicide. The urge to do himself in became so overwhelming that he called 911 and told them as much. The police arrived at Wardrip's hotel room. They asked him why he wanted to kill himself. He told them he killed Tina Kimbrew. He didn't mention any of the other murders at the time. He was placed under arrest. Wardrip was assigned a public defender. His prospects in court did not look good for him. A former friend named Thomas Eugene Granger called the police and reported that Wardrip knew all the women who had been murdered in Texas during that period. He knew Wardrip worked at Wichita General and that he lived near Subs and Suds. Granger gave a full affidavit, though it did not factor into the investigation and court proceedings significantly at that time. Wardrip came up with a way to make himself look better while tarnishing Tina Kimbrew's reputation. He would claim to have been involved with a Mexican cartel and that Tina was involved in the trafficking of narcotics. He claimed he gave her a sizable amount of drugs and money, and that when he arrived at her apartment to retrieve them, he found that neither were present. He claimed the decision to kill her was made by the cartel, and that he was only an emissary and hitman. In court, he would say, I didn't mean to kill her. I just went to get drugs. It was an accident. She was my friend. The jury didn't buy it. He was sentenced to 35 years. Danny Lachlan died during an automobile accident in 1993 and was still suspected of having murdered Tony Gibbs. Varian Wardrip lied, manipulated, and acted the part of a model inmate, for he was paroled in 1997 at the age of 39. He faced strict parole conditions, like wearing an ankle bracelet. He became deeply involved at his church, convincing his fellow parishioners that he wasn't the homicidal scumbag that he really was. Wardrip married a woman he met at church in 1998. His father got him a job at a door and screen manufacturer. Just as it appeared to Farian that he could leave his criminal past behind, a new breakthrough occurred in the investigations of the unsolved murders. Genetic material collected from the remains of Tony Gibbs and Terry Sims was determined to have been deposited from a single offender. It was also about this time that the statement given by Thomas Eugene Granger was re-examined. A new inquiry was put into motion. February 1999, Furian Wardrip was taken into custody. His DNA was collected after a plainclothes cop monitored him in a laundromat and seized a paper coffee cup Wardrip drank from and tossed in a garbage can. One man's trash, an investigator's treasure. Wardrip saw this and demanded to know what was going on. The detective said he needed a cup to spit into for chewing tobacco. Wardrip was baffled, but it's Texas, so it ultimately sounded halfway plausible. Once the cup was processed at the lab, it was proven that Farian Wardrip was a serial killer. John Little was a detective who brought the coffee cup to the lab, and it was he who would interview Farian Wardrip and get his confession. Wardrip waived his right to remain silent. This is from a transcript of the recording. Little, Farian, what I would like to do is just kind of go back to the beginning in your own words 
and start with events surrounding December 21st, 1984, if you would. This would be in reference to the death of Terry Sims. Wardrip. At that time, I was under heavy drugs, intravenous drugs, caused a lot of dysfunctional activities in my life. All it did was create hate in my heart. I was out walking, actually walking home. I had been in a fight with my ex-wife. Drugs had just totally taken control of my life. And as I was walking, she was at her door. I went up to the door and forced my way in. Well, I just ransacked her, just slung her all over the house in a violent rage, stripped her down and murdered her. Little. Did you have sex with her? Wardrip. No, I don't think I had sex. I'm almost pretty sure that I didn't have sex with her. I do remember stripping her down out of anger, but I don't recall having sex with her. Detective Little was about to stop the recording when Wardrip volunteered more information. Wardrip, my conscience has to keep going. There is one more. It ain't here, though. This is in Fort Worth. Wardrip confessed to the killing of Deborah Taylor. He was now charged with five murders. After having his guilt proven in a court of law, Farian Wardrip was sentenced to death. He remains on death row to this day. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.